What do you want to know? All of it. My life has never been dull up to this point. It's been an adventure. I think my life has been an adventure. Within a moment, there was like six cars jumped onto the sidewalk and at least 10 officers with guns drawn, yelling at us and screaming at us to hit the ground. People were stopping their cars and just lining up on the bridge, just looking down, like dancing up there and doing their thing. And it was amazing. For me, the loss was over $100,000. It was probably around $130,000, $140,000. You are my only child. Yeah, of course. I cannot even comprehend the repercussion of what you were doing. I would describe myself as a hustler. I was willing to always take the risk to get the reward. He always had so many things going on. He never seemed to struggle um, with money. He always seemed to just like fi figure something out. I didn't need the stability. I could be broke one day, and if I needed to make $1,000 the next, I'd find a way to do it. And I definitely think I probably got that from my mother and my father, you know? My whole ancestry is Russian. We lived in St. Petersburg or Leningrad. We came to Minnesota, they both got engineer jobs. Unfortunately, their marriage fell apart and they always joke, but the only good thing that came out of their marriage was me. We immigrated from Russia. We needed to start in America from ground zero. We came to America with five suitcases, $300. I couldn't speak English. Having the last name that I had, Kudaretsky, I stood out where I lived, you know, like, as a child, all you want to do is fit in with everyone. They were laughing at you. They were laughing, and you, and you had some fights because you were Russian and they call you Kami, yeah. and, and you were embarrassed that I speak this accent. Yeah. I didn't want anyone talking bad to me, so if somebody did, I stood up to them. And uh, it probably got me in trouble a lot, you know? I, I ended up physically fighting with people, rebelling against things, skipping classes. Probably when I was like 12 or 13, I really started to get in trouble. I really started to push back against everything that my parents were doing. And they had no control, they couldn't stop me. Right by that water tower, there's a bunch of woods. <clears throat> and that's where the woods were. We used to always skip class and go have fun. I was more interested on the hustle outside of school. I was more interested in what we were doing after and where, where we were going to sneak out and how we were going to sneak out. And, you know, so I think that already started my path of being uh, creative, you know? <laughs> I don't know if there was a reason why I was rebellious other than the fact that I was free enough to do it and I was ballsy enough to try it. I mean, if I had to feel guilty for anything in my life, I would probably say it's what I put my mother through growing up. She was already struggling as a single mother, trying to not only have a child, but being in a foreign country. And I think she probably sacrificed a lot in her life to, to keep me in line enough so that I didn't completely destroy myself. They finally asked me to leave. At one point, I ended up at another school about 10 minutes away. And after about six months there, they politely kind of same thing, asked my mom, take me out of there. She put me in the boarding school in Connecticut. And at that same time, it was kind of, I was finding music here and I was finding music in New York because I was living between the two. You know, when I was looking for this apartment, I had just come in possession of this record collection from uh, Thomas Spiegel, Man X. My living room became the whole record collection. So basically we shelved everything up. I spent more money than I've ever spent at Ikea on the shelves and uh, basically brought them all here and set them up kind of left to right across the whole apartment. And really the, the collection that I acquired was about 25,000 records. 
and I've slowly been going through the collection and, and kind of uh, weeding out the filler and getting rid of some of the, the stuff that I'm not interested in. His collection is that wall and this front, and then my collection is on this wall. I was always interested in music, but I, I think my addiction to records came from watching DJs, because the DJs at the time, there was no CD players, there was no USB sticks. It was pure vinyl. So, I mean, I got my first set of turntables when I was in boarding school, so I was like 16 and a half. And then I you know, was going to New York, just buying records off people, going to the used record shops, to new record shops, and I just became addicted. This is proper old Minneapolis warehouses. Like now they've all been converted, but this is what the city was known for, was all these old warehouses. My friends who come here from Detroit, they would always joke that Minneapolis is like Detroit, but with people. Because I had been traveling to New York so much, I had witnessed one of the first times Electric Indigo from Vienna had played her first set ever in America. I was so blown away by her that I was like, I want to book her for a party in Minneapolis. There was a guy here back in the day named DJ Slip, Troy Geary, who was 10, 15 years ahead of his time. And he was like, make your wish list. Who do you want to book? And I made it, and he got him for me. A local DJ here named uh, DJ Apollo, Dory, he helped us get the space by saying that we were all filming a video for MTV and that we were gonna have two to 3,000 extras. So yeah, this is like where I did my biggest party ever. <laughs> By far. The only demand they had was we wanted insurance papers, we wanted proof. So literally the night before, I'm at the local Kinko's copy shop and I'm basically drawing up fake insurance papers. I've got about 30 crew ready to drop speakers. I've got seven artists from Europe and, I, and they were not gonna give me the keys unless I show the security guy for the weekend these insurance papers. So I just walk in and pull them out of my backpack, hand it to him, and I'm just waiting patiently. He looks at it, he's like, everything looks in order, here's the keys. Open the door and we just proceeded to set up one of the biggest parties I had ever done. People dancing dug out inches off the floor and created a dust storm inside, you know, but it was, it was amazing. I mean, I, I wish I could do that again and repeat that. We were the epitome of Midwest rave culture, American rave culture. We had map point events where you would just get a, a phone number to call. The phone number would take you to a parking lot and the parking lot would be a guy who would hand you another set of directions. And that way we kept the police out. We kept the wrong crowd out. The people who were there wanted to be there and they wanted to be a part of this community and they wanted to be a part of this music and this revolution that was happening. I was coming home from work and my roommate at the time, Chuck, one of my best friends was at the neighbor's place down there. And I drove up, Chuck jumped on the hood, we drove it over here, we parked it, locked the doors. As we started walking up to the house, maybe about halfway here, we both turned around and we saw a police car driving down the street with the sirens going, but no, the lights on, but no sound. And then as we turned literally and just blinked within a moment, there was like six cars jumped onto the sidewalk and at least 10 officers with guns drawn yelling at us and screaming at us to go to the hit the ground and uh, you know they handcuffed us both walked us into the porch decided to raid my house they basically arrested me and charged me and uh, and that was the beginning of uh, the next two years of my life facing charges and and facing repercussion for making bad decisions During the 1997 event, I was already heavily involved with, with selling drugs. And at that point, I had funded my party based on that money. 
even though I'd lost so much money on that party, I didn't care. The money was disposable, the money was easy. So I continued to work in that hustle to try to basically make my money back and continue making money. For at least a year and a half, I was basically, um, I, was, I was selling acid. It's not a thing about bragging about my street cred and what I did or being tough or being, uh, you know, a hustler in that sense. I mean, it was stupid. And I didn't realize at 20 years old that I was crossed that line of being 18 and the penalties for what I could do was on an adult level. The worst case scenario for my case could have been a nine year sentence. So this is the Ramsey County Workhouse Correctional Facility. I got to spend about eight months of my life here. After the judge had heard both sides, my lawyers, the cops, the detectives, the evidence, everything, and she heard my final plea of, please don't put me away for a long time because I will become something else. She believed me and she allowed me to, to take the minimum sentence, which was a year and uh, nearly 30 years probation. You did push-ups, you did pull-ups, you played cards, you played dominoes, you watched some TV, but you were in a room with 40 guys all day. Had those mistakes not happened and had I not been caught, who knows if I would have been doing it five, six, seven years later and gone deeper into it. The penalties at that point would have been, you know, something that I wouldn't have been able to come back from. This was my lesson. I mean, after this, my life changed. I mean, maybe it took you a few years to realize that I was a changed person, but I think since then you see the difference in me and the fact that I, that was my turning point, that that was kind of my changing point of taking life serious and taking my choices serious and taking what I love and what I want serious. But you don't understand one thing. You are my only child. Yeah, of course. And being the only child, I cannot, in my mind, nothing, I cannot even comprehend the repercussion of what you were doing. It was extremely difficult to deal that my son broke uh, the law, that my son did something so human, uh, unhuman and did so abnormal. I sound like I'm a murderer. <laughs> you are not, but, but, but your idea to become rich and famous fast yeah, yeah, doesn't work. And you did not listen to any of us. No. And for that, I mean, yes, it was a lot of anxiety and I'm not proud of this. No, I'm absolutely not proud and I hope that it's not there. Of course. <laughs> yeah, there's the no movie. repeats, yeah. don't yeah. worry. But it was a very tough time in our lives. Right before the police came and raided me, I had just taken some of the money that I had earned and I had bought what, what ended up becoming like my first sound system and, and ultimately started my sound company. I wasn't walking out empty handed. I mean, I ultimately had a sound system waiting for me in this warehouse and I had a sound company that I could start and had an immediate legitimate purpose and a legitimate income. When that point in my life changed, I realized that my legitimate hustle was just as successful as my illegitimate hustle because really I was living life much better. I was just as, I think, in a lot of ways, financially as successful. And I didn't have to look over my shoulder all the time. I didn't have to lie. I didn't have to hide things. I, I didn't have a second exterior motive to everything. You know, in the end, it just took, it took a, a big knocking on, uh, on my head to, uh, to realize that that needed to change. Resurrection was the first party back after going away and serving my time and after dealing with everything. We called it resurrection because it was the resurrection of Hush and of me and of what I was doing. It was me putting everything on the line with real money. 
and I was going to risk all of it for a big scale party. And, you know, the day before we were going to throw the party, the venue that we were going to use was going to be the original venue I used in 1996 for my first ever party. And literally two days before we lost the venue and we found a new one under the bridge over in St. Paul behind the warehouse. A friend of mine had known the guy who was literally buying this building three days after we needed it. So we contacted him and he made a deal with the guy he was buying it from to let us go ahead and use this location as long as we didn't do the party inside the building. We got so many people coming and as they would park their cars, they would get into bigger groups and bigger groups that we started to get noise complaints, not from the sound, but from the neighborhood. And at about 5 a.m., the police officer shows up with the local fire marshal and they call me to the front door and they're like, we're gonna shut you down. There's too many people here. You guys can't be here. And so I said, come on, none of us are in the building. There's no occupancy issues. We're, we're, we're just outdoors. And he said, if I find anyone in the building, I'm shutting you down. So we literally walked them around the building. They saw that we weren't in the building. We walked them on the loading dock and literally we asked the DJ to stop for a second. I got on the microphone, the fire marshal, the police chief, were all standing next to me. And I'm, I basically said to the crowd, make some noise and show some love to the policeman and the fireman who's standing right here. And 3000 people cheered for them. And they were so embarrassed and so like overjoyed, they were just like, you guys are fine. And they left us alone. I just remember looking up from the crowd and seeing Zach on top of the speakers, walking back and forth with a mic, preaching to the crowd at how hard it was to make that party happen because their first venue had gotten shut down. And that was kind of the first time I was like, that's Zach, that's a devious one, now I get why everybody feels um, the way they do about why he's so special. I mean, this almost didn't happen. And for coming back for my first event, I mean, it couldn't have gone better. We were in the open air, 3,000 people, beautiful sound system, beautiful music, and a vibe that you just couldn't stop. I mean, even the police and the fire chief couldn't stop what we had going on down here. So. It was legendary. For me, this was showing me that like, you do something honestly, you do something real, you do something solid and powerful, you're gonna get that same power back. So it's not draining, it's actually fulfilling. Is it okay for us to come in? Okay, well then uh, we're, we're, we're coming in where resurrection was our coming back, ascension was kind of, we're here. And it was, for me, one of the coolest venues that I had ever done. Nobody in our scene of house and techno at the time had ever been a had access to that venue. My mother that night at Theatre de la Jeune Lune was, uh, she sold tickets for me. You know, when I did resurrection, I hid it from her. I didn't want her to know after all everything I had gone through with jail and everything I had gone through with throwing parties before, I really didn't want her to know that I was risking my life and my legitimate money again to do another party. I mean, at this point, she was not happy with my, my choices. But I was so proud of how resurrection happened and afterwards some newspapers wrote about it. My mother saw the articles and said, why didn't you invite us? You know, why didn't you let us see it? And I explained, she said, the next time you do a party, let us be involved, let us help you. So I put my mother at the door in the end, she was probably so strict with people that she was, she denied discounts when discounts would have been good. But you know, my mother did what she was supposed to do. If you weren't on the guest list, you weren't getting past my mother. You were paying. We had dancers in the windows up above, like uh, we had good and evil. So we had angels and devils kind of on either side of the venue. It was respectable. It was somewhere where you could bring anybody and say, this is house, this is techno, and this is the environment that it really works in. For eight years, I was fighting you as much as I could with electronic music. And then the stepfather, my late husband, he said, stop fighting him because we will lose him. <laughs> and I started to listen 
then I started to read some articles and slowly it's grown into me. The comments you made were, were of somebody who actually understood the music and listened to it and was really like connected to it. And I, and I understood that you appreciated it from a different level and you actually could see my skill in what I did or you saw the passion in what I did. After Bill's death, when I started to come to your parties, it will give me incredible freedom to dance and forget about uh, what is going on in my life. I would say that what I like about music, sometimes when I will go into the right mood, mm -hmm. the music is penetrating through me. It's incredible energy. And it's a life energy. This is what I would feel. My mother. <laughs> That's awesome. But, yeah. After Ascension, I had the idea of opening a club and everything just kind of continued to roll into the next progression of what I was going to do in my city. Looks the same! <laughs> so the reason why this was called Foundation is because if you notice, all the pillars all the way along the room, they're the foundation of the building. So that's how we kind of came up with the name Foundation. The only thing that stayed the same, they moved some of it, was like the highs. That was some of my old speakers. But otherwise, subs, I mean, we had like subs there, subs there, subs there, all the way underneath the DJ booth. This was the first place that gave Minneapolis in that era a proper dance club. I mean, this was a taste of what other cities already had that we just haven't had since the 90s. That was a big thing for him to open a club. I felt like the club for him was creating this ideal space um, in Minneapolis. There was a lot of moments there that this entire city still talks about today. Seeing Rolando there, seeing Jeff Mills there, seeing Larry Hurd there. It was just amazing to be able to see those guys in a club atmosphere in downtown Minneapolis, because typically you have to drive somewhere far to see that at a rave. It was an important part of my history to try to do this, because this is what I thought was the next natural progression for me to do. But we were fighting an uphill battle here with the city, with licensing, with cost, with police, with our neighbors. It lasted for about 18 months, and then about a month before that new year, we decided to tell everyone we were going to shut down for renovations, but in the end, we really just decided we were going to close the club, take our loss, and walk away. For me, the loss was over $100,000. It was probably around $130,000, $140,000. When you hustle, you have to be willing to take the risk and you have to be willing to lose everything. And it's like what my mother said when I called her after one of my parties, you know, in tears that I lost all this money. Don't play the game if you can't take the, the punishment. And she was totally right. And that's the way I lived. At that point, losing that much money, I was never tempted to go back to the game I was in. Um, I had lived life for too long away from that, that to go back to that was just never really an option. One of the things that defined me, or I thought defined me in this city, was my reputation as also being a sound guy, a sound freak. So when we had the club, my sound system at that time was in the club. And to get out of my debt, I had to sell everything I owned to clear over half of that debt. So I was so scared to let go of my identity. I was so scared to let go of what I thought defined me. And in the end, letting go of that freed me up. And in the end, paying off that debt freed up my stress. Letting go of the sound freed up my responsibility on weekends to work for other people. And it allowed me the headspace to focus on writing music. I made a bunch of music, paid off my debts. I met Ben Clock two months before I gave Derek May some of my first tracks. And those two first introductions brought me into what I'm doing now. It opened the door for me to come in as a DJ.
Derek gave me legitimacy and Ben gave me current status. And then I showed up with 15, 16 years experience at that time and proved myself as a DJ and then domino effect, it just kept going. I really was in the middle of my own little bubble in Minneapolis thinking, you know, what else do I have left for me to do? What, 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 what's next for me? You know, I had opened a club, I had thrown parties, I had run sound companies, I had DJed, and I was like, what's the next step? Berlin is not my home. It's, it's my second. But Bergheim, I would definitely say, feels like home to me when I walk in. Whether I'm playing, whether I'm just there to socialize, it just feels good. This is something that will be talked about in the history of techno later. You know, and you read these little books in our pocket of music and you hear about all these old clubs in every city. Every, every, every major city had their legendary club and it's now a part of history. I mean, this is a part of current history that will be written and later will be talked about. And I get to be a part of that and it's it, amazing. It's completely special. This would have happened to me 10 years before even. I don't think I would have been ready for it. I mean, I think I was still talented then. I think I still had something to say then, but I don't think I had the vision, the wisdom, the knowledge, the maturity to do what I'm doing now at the level I'm doing it. And it's not to say that some 22-year-old guy is not ready for this experience. He very well might be, and he very well might be completely talented. But I also believe that all the things I've done, not just with music, but with life in general and having problems and going through things and, you know, making mistakes teaches you more than success, I think. <laughs>